I mentioned four areas at the top of the show pertaining to Trump's legal liability. The FBI retrieval of documents from Mar-a-Lago, the DOJ investigation into January 6th, the Fulton County, Georgia investigation into attempts to disrupt the 2020 election, and the New York investigation into the Trump Organization's business practices. I will admit that I was on vacation for some of these new developments. I seem to have a habit of being on vacation when uh, important news breaks. So I will ask first and foremost, did I miss anything here? Are there any other important developments in you know legal issues surrounding Trump that I have not mentioned? I think the the most recent part of the story that perhaps you missed was um, the debate over whether or not to release the affidavit for the search warrant that was executed at Mar-a-Lago. So the same judge that unsealed the search warrant um, has said that he thinks parts of the affidavit could be unsealed um, and and parts of them would be redacted. And he's going to examine proposed redactions from the Department of Justice and decide whether or not to actually release it. So he's kind of open to the idea of releasing this affidavit, which would have much more information about the investigation and what uh, kind of prompted their desire to seek a search warrant. And this is something that Trump has said that he wants released. Um, Many Trump supporters have said they want it released. Interestingly, also people on the left want it released. You know, the sort of different motivations happening there, whether or not it actually is going to come out or if it's going to come out and just be a wall of like sharpied out, (laughs) blacked out text um, is is still something that we're waiting to learn. But that's sort of the latest installment of that that investigation. And what are, Kaylee, the biggest questions remaining as pertains to the information in that affidavit? I mean, we know what they were looking for from the search warrant that was released. We know what was found um, because that was shared as well to an extent. I mean, it was sort of literally some of the documents were called like miscellaneous. What's the word I'm thinking of? Top secret documents or something like that. (laughs) So we we don't know the details of every single thing that was found, but presumably the affidavit is going to have more information that's going to explain what the investigation found that led them to believe that there were classified documents at Mar-a-Lago, um, possibly, you know, how much Trump himself was involved in choosing to take those documents and store them there, how much he understood about whether they were classified or not. So there, there are still some questions as far as culpability of the former president. Okay. Sarah, we're yes. going to break this down into sort of three buckets here as we move through these okay. investigations. Kaylee, you have been tracking kind of the latest news on the context here um, as part of your beat. Sarah, you are tracking Trump's legal liability. Nathaniel, your kind of beat as far as these investigations go is public opinion. Okay, so Kaylee, thank you for providing that context. I did miss some of that, um, and I appreciate now being up to date. Sarah, what are the legal issues going on here specific to the Mar-a-Lago search? Right. So we know from what has been released that the Justice of Department is investigating Trump for three potential violations of criminal statutes, including one of the Espionage Act, which that encompasses crimes beyond spying. It's more so about the refusal to return national security documents upon request. And as Kaylee was saying, we now know that there are 21 boxes taken, so we know Trump falls into that category. There is also a question of destruction or removal of records that could lead to a charge and obstruction of justice for violating um, the Espionage Act. So to be clear, though, he has not been charged at this point. And one thing I thought was really interesting, Business Insider had this pretty thorough walkthrough of like all the different possible scenarios here for for the range of legal woes facing Trump and what that could mean for 2024. And they made a comparison to what happened to Giuliani last year where the FBI raided his home and they seized more than a dozen of his electronic devices as part of a criminal investigation into whether he broke foreign lobbying laws. And so earlier this month, though, they returned his devices and the New York Times reported that he is unlikely to face criminal charges related to his work in Ukraine. That is very much a real possibility here. We don't know that that's where this is headed, but I thought that was an interesting comparison point um, as we wait to see what the Department of Justice's next actions are. All right. Okay. Got it. So now the politics part, Nathaniel, what does the public think about what is going on here other than a poll of one 
confusion. A little bit of confusion and opaqueness. <laughs> Indeed. So Americans think it would be a problem if Donald Trump took classified material with him uh, to Mar-a-Lago, according to a YouGov poll that was conducted, I think, the day of or uh, the day after um, the the search. Uh, 45% said it would be a very big problem, and another 17% said it would be somewhat of a problem. Only 11% thought it would be not a very big problem, and only 13% thought it would be not a problem at all. Of course, in that YouGov poll, things were pretty polarized by party. Democrats tended to think it would be a very big problem to to take classified material with him, and Republicans tended to think it wasn't a problem, but they were a little squishy on it. But um, on other questions that were asked by a different poll by political morning consult also uh the day after or a couple days after the the search um things kind of broke down a lot more familiarly along the partisan lines that we have gotten used to over the years so for example according to this political morning consult poll um, 49 percent said that they strongly or somewhat approved of the fbi's decision to search mar-a-lago and 37 percent said that they strongly or somewhat disapproved now if those numbers sound familiar that kind of 50 to 40 ish ratio that's because that was very similar to donald trump's approval ratings for the four years basically that he was president his approval rating hovered around 40 percent something you know low 40s typically um and his disapproval rating tended to be you know around 50 to 55 percent um and you know there was another question in the more political morning console poll that broke down similarly which is did the fbi search mar-a-lago basically because there's actual evidence that he committed a crime or was it basically a, a witch hunt the wording they used was was it motivation to damage his political career and again 49 percent said it was because there was evidence he committed a crime 39% said it was to damage his political career. So you can see the same partisan divisions um, kind of coming to bear in these polls. Yeah. And I, I was remiss like to walk through a little bit more the different legal liabilities he faces. I said that there were three potential federal laws he violated. And to just run through them quickly, that Espionage Act, you know, if convicted, maximum penalty of 10 years in prison. The second one, which was about the concealment, removal, or um, destruction of government records, that carries a maximum of three years penalty and a possible disqualification from holding public office. I say possible because particularly in this idea of Trump running again for president, you know, legal experts think that ultimately the Constitution and requirements there, which don't say anything about um, imprisonment, will kind of supersede that ruling. But then the final one um, around, you know, impeding the or obstructing the investigation, that could be a maximum of 20 years in prison. So 33 years um, of incarceration in total. But again, like that's the possible worst case scenario. I do think at this point, the Giuliani example is illustrative in the sense of, you know, a former sitting president has not been in this situation whether the Department of Justice further chooses to escalate the situation to criminally charge Trump, there's just so many political factors they'll have to keep in mind with that, in addition to what, what their case is and what they'd be able to, to argue in front of a jury. I want to dig a little bit more into the broad 2024 ramifications and sort of the, the much broader politics of what it means to have a potential candidate facing legal issues. But let's run through a little bit more of the latest in these investigations first. So that was the Mar-a-Lago search. Next is the Department of Justice January 6th uh, investigation into the attack on the Capitol. Obviously, we have talked about this before. In large part, the developments have revolved around, you know, charging and sentencing individuals who entered the Capitol on the actual day. But when it comes to Trump specifically, Given the reporting from the Washington Post that was backed up by the New York Times in late July, what, Kaylee, are we thinking about in terms of how this touches Trump? Right. So that reporting showed that the investigation is at least looking at Trump and his behavior. They've asked to speak to former aides to Vice President or then Vice President uh, Mike Pence about conversations that were held around January 6th. Um, if you've been watching the the hearings that happened, you know, the, the House Committee has been making the case that there was really a pressure campaign against Pence. And they had a lot of testimony kind of backing that up, that Trump was really um, encouraging the vice president to do things that he, he simply couldn't do. Whether or not those behaviors and sort of what's been captured uh, in the committee hearings 
constitutes a, a crime is is obviously up to the Department of Justice to figure out through their investigation. And honestly, there hasn't been a whole lot leaking out of that aside from that sort of general reporting that Trump is part of it. But that doesn't necessarily, you know, that's different from a charge being laid. And I think that of all of his legal woes, that one is the murkiest to me. Um, the, the sort of best information we have is coming out of these committee hearings. And nothing in those has really been kind of a smoking gun pointing to obvious criminal acts by Trump. Uh, so that, yeah, that's sort of the murkiest one as far as these these legal issues. And it, we'll have to wait and see if anything else comes out of that particular investigation. Yeah. So on that note, in terms of legal possibilities that Trump faces, we're at that stage where reporters are just talking to legal <laughs> scholars because they can't talk to Merrick Garland and say, what's up? So here are the three kind of big charges that potentially someone like Garland could bring forward. One of which is obstructing an official proceeding for Trump's alleged efforts to block Congress's vote count on January 6th. A second charge could be conspiracy to defraud the United States, and that would be in connection with various schemes like the one in Georgia we'll talk about to overturn the results of the presidential election. A third possible charge, inciting a riot or insurrection, that apparently has been kind of diminished in, in recent weeks, but this is based on um, interviews that VOA, which is a, a national radio conglomerate here in the U.S., had with um, legal scholar Jonathan Turley, who is a conservative law professor at George Washington University. Other experts they talked with said obstruction is pretty straightforward. As you know, Kaylee was getting at, there is documentary evidence as well as witness testimony from the hearings that suggest that Trump was trying to stop Pence from carrying out his task of you know, um, certifying the vote that day. But people like Turley aren't necessarily convinced um, and think that, you know, the problem with this is that he, he cited in previous instances, Democrats have protested certification of Republican presidents. You can't say that, you know, voting to decertify the results is obstruction. So this seems at this point to have um, uh, Mueller investigation 2.0 written all over it. Um, obstruction could be something that the Department of Justice wants to move forward with, but we have no indication at this point how they're thinking and whether they'll actually file criminal charges. And I just want to make a note quickly that even though it's all one sort of big investigation, this big kind of grand investigation into the attack on the Capitol on January 6th, the charges we've seen so far, then it's about, it's 895, I think was the last count of individuals who were charged for their actions on the day. That's a very different category. These are individuals who by and large, went into the Capitol. Um, so trespassing is an easy one. They were breaking windows. They were assaulting police officers. Like these are obvious crimes that were committed and documented. And, you know, there's great evidence um, for many of these cases. So that kind of action is a little more clear cut. Um, a lot of people who were there on the day but didn't go into the building, um, you know, didn't commit any crimes, haven't been charged with anything. And that's very different from this kind of more, uh, I don't know, political question of Trump's actions and, you know, what statements did he make to the vice president? What does that constitute? That's a lot different than kind of like somebody smashed through a window and then stole, uh, you know, papers off of Nancy Pelosi's desks. You know, those, these are kind of different investigations, even though they're all part of one overarching investigation. With something of this high profile, you would imagine that the Department of Justice doesn't want to bring charges unless it's close to an open and shut case because it's going down a pretty complicated road, given that a former president has never been charged with a crime and this particular former president is considering running for election. Given that sensitivity around this, um, Nathaniel, what do we, how, how are Americans thinking of it? Well, Galen, stop me if you've heard this before, um, but uh, in the case of January 6th, uh, we have a YouGov poll from uh, three weeks ago. It was the beginning of August. 
Uh, 45% of Americans thought that Trump should be charged um, in connection with January 6th, and 39% said he shouldn't be. Um, and again, partisan splits here. Um, one interesting thing about this poll was it, when you ask people if Trump will be charged, like to basically asking people to be pundits and to predict it, 44% said that he wouldn't be, and 23% said that he that he would be. So, uh, although 33% weren't sure, but um, it definitely seems like their Americans are a little bit more, um, you know, they're thinking that the Department of Justice kind of won't go through with it, presumably. Well, actually, I guess I shouldn't assume what they're thinking. um, But, you know, you could imagine, you know, they think, yeah, you know, maybe he, you know, by the letter of the law should be charged, but politically it would be, you know, too risky. Or maybe they are just cynical and think, you know, politicians get away with this stuff all the time. Um, But I thought that disconnect was interesting. Yeah, Nathaniel, haven't some of the polls also asked, like, you know, do you think Trump's involvement in January 6th was, like, essentially wrong, but then follow it up by asking, do you think he should be charged? Um, yeah, well, in in the case of this YouGov poll, they, they asked, you know, do you think he did anything illegal uh, on, uh, you know, or re- with regard to January 6th? And it was very similar to the person who thought that he should be charged. People said 44 to 38 percent that he did do something illegal. Um, in terms of, uh, you've, you, you seem perhaps more often like these questions about how much responsibility he has for for the Capitol riot. Uh, and in that YouGov poll, 42 percent said he had a lot of responsibility, uh, which lines up with you know, pretty well with the percentage who think that he should be charged. But then an additional 13% said he had some responsibility. So maybe those are folks who think, yeah, he, you know, he egged them on, but it doesn't rise to, you know, a criminal level. Yeah, no, I was asking, because that's something I remember from covering the Mueller report was many Americans Mm -hmm. were like, yeah, I think Trump did something wrong, but I'm not sure he should be charged. Mm -hmm. And we saw that with impeachment. um, Mm -hmm. And potentially we're seeing that with this as well. I mean, what does that mean? Politically, I guess, if you're because it seems like in this case, there is a majority of Americans who think that Trump acted poorly surrounding January 6th, even if they don't think he should be charged or even if they don't think that he committed a crime, period. But does that mean then that, like, those people probably don't want him to be president again and that are, you know, and are there enough people like that in the Republican Party that cause that could be caused to have doubts about his viability in a theoretical 2024 primary? Probably not, Galen. Um, You know, again, the the partisan splits in these polls show that Republicans um, overwhelmingly believe that, you know, this is politically motivated. They believe that he did nothing wrong, or at least that it doesn't rise to the level of criminality. Um, There was, so in, um, according to Political Morning Consult, who polls periodically on the 2024 primaries, you know, obviously it's still very early, but, you know, it's interesting to see perhaps the the trends there. And um, in their most recent poll, which was conducted a couple of days after the the Mar-a-Lago raid, um, 58% of Republican voters said they would vote for Trump in the 2024 primary, which was actually um, only by a couple percentage points, but it was the highest number that he had uh, registered in that poll uh, since 2020. Um, so I think that shows you that the Republican base is, is still behind him. Um, that said, of course, you know, he has to win a general election as well. Um, and of course that's, you know, always going to be the rub with Donald Trump, because once you get out of Republican territory and into independents and especially Democrats, views of him change very quickly. Um, so actually we at 538 have a, a polling, um, average for favorable and unfavorable views of Trump, uh, overall. Uh, among the public. And so, you know, this could just be a blip. Um, it's certainly within the, you know, the usual range of Donald Trump's feelings. But on the day of the Mar-a-Lago raid, his net favorable rating was negative 11, uh, which basically means that 11 percentage points more people had an unfavorable rating of him than a favorable rating of him. And that has gone up today to a negative, or sorry, gone down to negative 15. Um, so there was a little bit of an increase in negative feelings toward Donald Trump after the raid. Again, the negative 15 range is well within the kind of normal range for Donald Trump. There have been some small fluctuations for this for years, um, but maybe interesting. Maybe, you know, obviously there are, are margins of error here and there could be noise. There could also be a signal, but perhaps this is quite illustrative of the challenges of 
sometimes things that rile up your base don't go over well with the general public and a permanent conundrum for politicians who need to win primaries and then go on to win general elections as we have seen before. Let's move on from this and talk a little bit about some of the local investigations. I think some of these local investigations have gotten a little less coverage than the federal investigations, but nonetheless, I think the first one we'll talk about is somewhat serious. So that's the investigation in Fulton County, Georgia, into, you know, basically attempts to overturn the result in that state, um, or at least mess with it. You know, we, we have been over this. We have talked about Raffensburger on this podcast before. Where does all of that stand? Right. So there's uh, a grand jury that is considering uh, the investigation that the district attorney has been putting together there as to whether or not Trump committed a crime in his efforts to um, change the results in Georgia. You know, we, as you mentioned, Brad Raffensperger, we've all heard the, the recorded phone call of Trump asking him to find the exact number of votes that he needed to, to win the state. Um, so that investigation or that grand jury is considering that um, the latest news was last week uh the President Trump's lawyer, former lawyer, advocate, uh, Rudy Giuliani, being called to testify. Um, Lindsey Graham was subpoenaed, but has been fighting it and, and hasn't gone to testify yet. So that's sort of the latest updates of that. You know, it's going to be up to the grand jury to decide whether or not to indict the former president, to indict Rudy Giuliani, anybody else who might have been involved in um, some of the behavior, specifically with Georgia officials after the election. So... This case um, being led by District Attorney Fannie Willis in Georgia potentially could charge Trump with criminal charges of election fraud solicitation, interference with the performance of election duties, and racketeering. This was another Business Insider piece, but they did a really interesting you know, historical look at Fannie Willis, the reputation she's built in the state. And I think a key thing to understand about her is she has a career of successfully using racketeering charges, in this case about Atlantic public school teachers conspiring to alter student test scores and getting those teachers convicted on conspiracy charges, you know, something typically kind of reserved for organized crime. So that is thought of as one avenue that Georgia might pursue in their prosecution of Trump. That said, I think a key thing to kind of think through here is right now, you know, we're hearing stuff about Giuliani, about Senator Graham. The probe is not just looking at Trump. It's Trump's inner circle. And I think similar to the other legal problems facing Trump, the question becomes, what did he specifically do? And will they be able to establish a convincing um, racketeering scheme, for instance, that Trump really was exerting a coercion campaign on getting people in Georgia to overturn the results? All right. Who wants to take a wild guess at where public opinion <laughs> falls when it comes to former President Trump's uh, actions? I feel like we Georgia? could just take a clip. You know, actually, I would Daniel be kind of su- just like play it on loop every time <laughs> you ask you to punt to him. In reality, I would be kind of surprised if people were following this all that closely. I mean, and in fact, I think the granularity, we're not even going as granular as we could. Obviously, we are not a legal podcast. There are podcasts that are dedicated entirely to this stuff. But like, I have to think that most people aren't even coming this close to understanding the different legal issues at play. Um and so I, I would be curious, and then you'll do people have opinions on the Fulton County, Georgia investigation? Do they have enough information to opine on it? Well, Galen, we don't know, because uh, to your point, it has kind of flown under the radar so much that uh, we, or I should be more specific, our excellent intern, Emily, was unable to find any polling of it since January 2021. Um, if you know there are polls out there that we missed, please let us know, listeners. But um this poll back from you know January 2021 was January 4th specifically because January 2021 is obviously a very active um, month and you know it matters I think when it was taken um, found again kind of similarly um, to the ratios we've been seeing uh, 51% of Americans thought that Trump's call to Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger um, 
did constitute wrongdoing and 33 percent said it did not um, i would imagine if you asked today you would see similar numbers you know along party lines you know, maybe with a larger percentage of people saying they were undecided because maybe they don't remember the story or they haven't been following it um but yeah as far as the sort of the politics around that case in particular one development that did sort of go into that area was so, so in Georgia and in a couple states, there were individuals who signed on to be like alternate electors for Trump. Um, and some of those individuals, the grand jury has subpoenaed to to testify and, and they want to talk to them. Um, recently, a, a judge barred uh, the district attorney involved in this case from investigating one of those alternate electors, uh, Republican State Senator Burt Jones, because he's currently running for office and the district attorney Fannie Willis um, actually held a fundraiser for his Democratic opponent. And so you can see some of the politics kind of trickling in here. Uh, Obviously, if anything rises out of this, um, you know, that's going to be part of Trump's push because with all of these investigations, he's claimed it's just a partisan witch hunt. It's just the Democrats being afraid of him. uh, And that's sort of been his defense through a lot of these investigations. Maybe this is the part where I can bring up another aspect of the Politico Morning Consult polling, which I found interesting. Since we don't have maybe very specific polling on how people feel about this investigation in the moment, Morning Consult just asked generally of Americans, do you think (laughs) Trump broke the law while he was president? And in total, uh, 58% of Americans said Probably or definitely. So 42% said definitely, 16% said probably. When it comes to whether they said no, probably not, or no, definitely not, uh, that was only 31%. So 18% said definitely not, 13% said probably not, with 12% undecided. Obviously, there is there are partisan differences there, but with numbers that big, you see that at least a quarter of Republicans say that former President Trump definitely or probably broke the law while he was president. So to the point about Americans not paying close attention to like individual investigations, you could still see that there's a vibe here that people think shady things were going on while, you know, uh, former President Trump was president. In fact, I haven't looked up past polling on past presidents. There is, I think, a general sense in this country of mistrust of institutions, politicians, et cetera. So I think that you do this poll of any, you know, former president did this, you know, I'm sure if you polled Democrats, if George W. Bush broke the law while he was president, a lot of people, a lot of Democrats would say yes, even if they couldn't point to like one specific thing. But what should we make of that? Like, is Maybe we need the polling to make a comparison to see how unique this is for Trump. Um, but that's that stood out to me. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think it goes back to what I was trying to get at earlier with the Mueller investigation in this sense that I do think, Galen, there is a sense that, right, Trump did some shady shit. But when it comes to actually holding him accountable, that's where I think Americans start to drop off. And I don't know if it's because they fear political ramifications for that, the divisiveness that it will add to the country, if they just wish it was all over. I mean, I think Nathaniel made some really good points, though, about it's easy to be lulled into that argument, particularly among Republicans, that, yes, they embrace Trump, but, you know, we because we have seen evidence and fractures of, like, someone like Ron DeSantis could give Trump a real run for his money if he were to run again in 2024. We've seen someone like Senator McConnell say, hey, our Republican picks for the Senate might not be not might not do so good this year because Trump was heavily involved in filling the slate of candidates. Yet at the same time, you know, like the Senate um, committee that's pouring, you know, millions of dollars into these races, you know, has McConnell's blessing. They're not backing away from the Trump backed candidates. And that's what I think is kind of challenging in all of this is sussing out how much Americans are actually really done with Trump, including Republicans, but maybe actually really liked Trump's policies and maybe aren't opposed to another Trump term. And I think the answers and signals there are just all over the place. Well, I think also there is a gap there with people's sort of sense of right and wrong or how they would like a president to behave and actual legal understanding. I mean, these are complicated 
uh, legal conditions and questions being raised, you know, I don't know how familiar the average American is with the Espionage Act. And so this is like complicated stuff that I think would maybe um, prevent somebody from very firmly saying, yes, I think he committed a crime or no, I don't think he did commit any crimes. Like these are complicated issues. Before we wrap up, there's one more sort of set of legal issues facing the former president, which are out of New York. Um, I, from the headlines, I saw that uh, former President Trump pled the fifth. I also saw headlines about the former CFO of the Trump Organization. Kaylee, uh, what are the details that I, I missed in my in my in my cursory uh, news notifications while I was on vacation? I mean, very quick. I mean, those are, are the headlines. Really quickly, there are two cases. There's a civil case and then a criminal case. The civil case is where Trump came in and pled the fifth a bunch of times. The criminal case is where um, Weisselberg was pleading guilty to tax fraud. What's interesting about his plea deal there is that he agreed to testify against the Trump organization, but not against Trump himself. He's not going to say anything about the former president. Got it. And so, Sarah, this is like a different category of thing. You know, this is before Trump was president. Um, in large part, this is about his business practices, not about his presidency. Uh, I mean, why is this even coming to the fore now, actually? I mean, because of all the things that you could point to and say, like, this seems political, you know, like the other things are about his presidency and the aftermath of his presidency. But why in 2022 are we talking about Trump's business practices? Because Trump's a businessman um, and this case hasn't been resolved yet. I mean, to your point, this is something that has predated his... um, you know, time in the presidency is not about, you know, behavior in the presidency. It's about his business practices in New York. And it's been an ongoing saga where there haven't been um, clear charges in either. Well, I mean, I guess to the extent like there were charges against Weisselberg, for instance, in the criminal case, but not against Trump. Um, And in the civil case, that's gone back and forth in terms of continuing to investigate, but no clear charges made. And is it clear like how significant this would even be if there were like what is the liability here i mean the liability on the criminal front right could be imprisonment um but as we were talking about earlier you know there's nothing to bar uh someone running from office doing that from prison or recently out of prison um the civil like case is a little for tax fraud or what? For tax fraud. Yeah, for ta- right. For, you know, inflating the worth of his business and misleading investors. Um, and for the civil component, you know, that's less clear what the ramifications would necessarily be for 2024. The idea that scandals in principle aren't good for a, um, you know, potential candidate. But as we've seen, Trump kind of defies what's expected of a potential candidate. All right, so let's stay in New York, but switch topics. And we're still going to go to you, Nathaniel. There is a primary in New York on Tuesday. There are also two special elections. There are also primaries in Oklahoma and Florida. We did not forget you guys. But as usual, what's happening in New York is more important. Um, ha, 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 ha. Wow, shots but, fired. But it's true. But it's true. Well, does anyone here want to disagree with me on that? Sadly, I don't. Yeah. No. There you go. That's what I thought. Okay. I mean, from an election denier perspective, my eyes are on Florida, but fair enough. I, I wouldn't argue that it's the more important state. <laughs> um, Nathaniel, we are going to have a reaction podcast on Wednesday. We are also going to be live vlogging this Tuesday night. So just run through like what information we're waiting to learn, basically. We don't have to run through like every single candidate who's running, but just what the stakes are. Oh, I was going to run through every single candidate, Galen. Um, no, so, um, so New York, um, of course its congressional map got thrown out at kind of the last minute, which is why it's holding this second delayed primary. We already had the primary for statewide offices like governor, um, but congressional races got kicked to August because the map had to be redrawn. Um, and this has caused a lot of kind of scrambling, uh, within the state delegation. Um, I think the two main races are the 12th district, which is pitting, um, two incumbents, uh, democratic incumbents, Jerry Nadler and Carolyn Maloney against each other. Um, My district, Nathaniel. There you go, Galen. Don't, don't forget to vote. Um, I can't, I'm an unaffiliated voter and New York has closed primaries. But, uh, 
yeah so so this is a um you know they've both been in office for a long time they are kind of fixtures nadler on the upper west side of manhattan uh, maloney on the upper east side and one of them is not going to be in congress next year it looks like nadler has the upper hand he got the new york times endorsement he got chuck schumer's endorsement um you also have a third notable challenger Suraj patel who primaried carolyn maloney uh, in the last two cycles who's also running in this so he's probably eating into her east side um kind of voter base um so that's the one interesting primary the second is in the 10th district which is in lower manhattan and part of brooklyn um this is a free-for-all so um basically it's a long story but what happened was representative mondair jones who represented um a district just north of new york city um during redistricting when the new maps got drawn sean patrick maloney who represents the next district upstate um basically announced he was going to run in mondair jones's district without telling anybody or consulting anybody um because it's a slightly safer blue district and also maloney lives there um that left Monder jones basically up a creek without a paddle and he, what he ultimately decided to do was go down to lower manhattan and brooklyn to run in this newly open 10th district which is essentially the district that um is kind of left behind was was kind of left behind on the wayside when um carolyn maloney and jared nadler decided to run against each other see it's complicated <laughs> um but mondaire jones is now running in the 10th district he's like kind of the incumbent but he has no real ties to the area you also have a lot of local um politicians like kind of notable state assembly members and new york city councilors who are also running and that's basically a, a total free-for-all but the candidate who seems to be the front runner right now is dan goldman who is uh, the heir to the levi strauss gene fortune which is not a thing you say very often um and he's also the guy who um was the lead democratic counsel in trump's first impeachment so folks might remember him from that he spent a lot of money on this race he is has emerged as kind of the leading polling candidate he's still only polling in like the 20s it's still a very unsettled race and kind of the stakes of this race are a bit the you know tale as old as time progressive versus more moderate democrats um but i think what we'll be talking about in the day after this election is the special elect or the special elections um because they're going to give us a more granular view of the political environment or give us at least two more data points as to what the political environment looks like. Um, is there anything to say? I mean, should we just wait and see what the margins are when they come in? Or is there anything you want to say about that before we sign off, Nathaniel? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think we need to obviously see what the results are. Um, but as you mentioned, there are two special elections for House. Um, one, the 23rd district is not very competitive. But as you mentioned, we'll be looking at the margin to kind of see if there's any sign for the political environment. The other in the 19th district, that is a swing district. Um, and so that legitimately could go either way. This is a Democratic held or it used to be democratic held um by the um now lieutenant governor of new york antonio delgado republicans think they have a good shot at taking it over they've got a pretty strong candidate in mark molinaro um and of course with democrats narrow margins in the house you know that could that's not a seat that democrats would like to lose um but again also this will be viewed as a sign of kind of how energized democrats are or republicans are um you know in the you know in the case of Democrats, uh, in the wake of the Dobbs decision, in the case of Republicans, just in general with an unpopular Democratic president. And this primary is not this week, but we'll also have the final results in Alaska's House special election, which will be useful for the piece Nathaniel's working on. Is, has there been a shift in special elections since Dobbs? Stay tuned. Yeah, we got lucky from a data perspective because basically the Supreme Court handed down this decision in Dobbs at the end of June, and there happened to be five special elections scheduled for the successive weeks. Um, so we are getting a pretty decent sample size, especially for so late in the cycle. Um, of what the political environment is like. And some of those special elections, most notably in Nebraska's first district and Minnesota's first district, really seem to have good signs for Democrats. And, and we're starting to point toward the idea that maybe they do have the, the energy behind them. Um, but uh, obviously, these, these two races in New York in particular, you know, that'll basically double our the number, amount of data that we have. Uh, so we don't want to draw too many conclusions quite yet. But we'll have more to say on Wednesday. All right. Well, let's leave it there. Thank you, Sarah, Kaylee, and Nathaniel. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Kaylee. Thanks, y'all. 
My name is Galen Druk. Emily Vineski is our intern and is in the control room today. Chadwick Matlin is our editorial director, and Anna Rothschild is on video editing. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we will see you soon. Bye.